So let's just, this is going to be my final presentation in the course. I don't know why they schedule almost everything after lunch. Probably they pretend that I go fast and then you cannot sleep siesta well, but okay. Okay, I try to do my best. Okay, um, so if you remember again from this morning, um, just wanted to concentrate just this afternoon. I will explain just a little bit, don't worry about the physics and so on, but I will try to make it easy. I will explain the other two uh, much more uh, important optical biosensor, the micro ring resonator and the interfer integrated interferometers. I will explain the physics and then we go just to see real applications again as I showed you before and if I have time I would like also to show other European projects where we have been involved making real point of care devices just to go to hospital or to go to Africa for example to do uh, evaluation of the real real people. Okay, so just starting with micro ring resonators. So just for the name, you can deduce that this, uh, this is a, a ring resonator. It's just a ring, and we make a waveguide. It's a very, very miniaturized device fabricated with microelectronics technology where you have uh, this ring, and the idea is the following. You use just an input waveguide with different wavelengths, and then for one of them, you are entering a resonant mode, and then you can incorporate the light with a specific wavelength inside the ring. This is the, li the light then is going in rounded in this, in this ring uh, using what we call the whispery gallery modes. So the li light is all time uh, going, uh, doing uh, rounded. So again, we are in the condition where we have this evanescent wave profile, the light is traveling in the interior of this ring, has this evanescent wave profile, so we can use this for biosensing again. We put our bioreceptor, and then what happens is that when you have a biomolecular interactions, I mean, in the ring, you have a specific peak of the resonant peak for a specific wavelength, and when you have some biomolecules, because again, you change locally the reflected index, you see just a complete displ displacement to the right, to the infrared, just to the, this resonant peak. So this is very important, the quality of the ring resonator, because depending on the quality, the light can be doing many rounds, and then the interaction with the biomolecules is, 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 uh, is larger. So means that the quality factor, that is just a, uh, just a factor that is uh, measuring the losses inside the ring, and how much time is the lifetime of the photons inside the ring is a very important parameter. So normally, you should use a, a ring resonator with quality factor, Q factors, around 10 to 6 to have a very good biosensor. Okay, so this is the physics idea. Okay, again, we have described it in our reviews in more detail, the physics behind that. But then with this, you can do a really, really exciting biosensor. The geometry, I mean, you need only a ring, so, but you can use many different types of rings. So people are using a planar ring that you can fabricate it with a standard silicon, silicon dioxide, or even in polymer material. Other people are using these microtoroids. I know that this is a, a group with a strong expertise in these microtoroids and this ring resonator in, in Unicampi, for example, in the physics faculty, doing the, all these kind of uh, resonators. It's possible you also, also to use a ma complete microsphere, and with this, you can have also a very high sensitivity. So normally, with all these ring resonators, you can go for a sensitivity close to 10 minus 7, so this is more or less the same sensitivity that you can get with surface plasma resonant biosensor. Okay, so the main advantage is, as you can see here, that you can produce many, many rings in parallel. So in theory, you can have thousands of these rings, so you can have a very high level of multiplexing. Okay, so the only product on the market just now using this technology is from a, um, the US company called Genanalyte. And they have been the only one able to produce that they call the Maverick uh, biosensor device, where they are able to provide chips. You can see here the size of the chip, just in the finger of the person. And then in this uh, small chip, you can have up to 128 ring resonator biosensor. Uh, so they have been publishing how it's possible. Look at here at the size, how it's possible to immobilize a different bioreceptor in each uh, ring. So you can have a very high level of multiplexing, just using just a drop of the sample of the person, then you can do a real, real multiplexing 
uh, evaluating all these biomarkers in the, in, the uh, in the same sample. You can see here, uh, just since this is a microscopic image, you can see here the ring resonator. Here are the waveguides where they input the light inside the resonator, and there are more fancy, I mean, some lens and so on to encoupling the light. So they have been able to produce, this is a standard microelectronics fabrication, more than six, 600 uh, sensors for each wafer. Of course, you can uh, think, how, t how do you allocate a bioreceptor in each of these rings? Because the size of each ring is a very few microns. So there is dedicated machine, a spotting machine, where you can go one, one by one and then, and then to deposit your bioreceptor in each ring. So I really don't know the price of this Marvel system, but I think it's close to 100,000 US dollars in the market. And remember, the problem is not to buy the machine. The main uh, point here is how to get the biochip. Because now you have to buy, every time that you do an analysis, you throw it away, and then you have to buy another one. So probably in this, uh, in this area, in biosensor, the most expensive one is not instrumentation per se, is the biochip. Because uh, every time that you do an analysis, especially in the clinical area, you cannot reuse the biosensor. You make an analysis and you have to throw it away, according with the clinical regulations. So it's like uh, happened with the glucose biosensor. You know that the diabetic people just make an analysis and throw away the whole biosensor. In my lab, we know uh, how to recover all the biosensor. We reuse many, many times. But if you want to go for a real clinical testing, then you cannot reuse anymore. So just uh, think about that, then we can discuss later on if the technology is enough, low cost, as we say, uh, to provide all this diagnostic in the future. Okay, so just starting also with interferometric biosensor, uh, probably you know interferometry is the most sensitive technique in physics. So that's the reason why we decided why not to make an interferometer on chip and then with this, we can have the most sensitive biosensor. So it was our idea when we started with this many years ago. So just in a standard uh, interferometer, normally the most uh, common configuration is called Max Fender interferometer. And here what you have is just a single weight guy, and then it's divided in two. One we call the sensing area, and the other one we call the reference. So the light is splitting in the two sensing and reference. And then the light is traveling there, and then they are recombining it again, what you can see in my video. So the light is uh, in coupling, going to the sensing, go to the reference, and then they recombine again. What happens is the following. The light that is traveling here, they have also this evanescent wave profile that I explained many times. Now must be very clear for you what is an evanescent wave, OK? Uh, so. In the sensing area, we allocate our bioreceptor. And in the, in the reference, we don't allocate anything. What happens is when the light is traveling there, in the reference, they found the molecules. And then the velocity of the light change, the phase change. I mean, the, the phase of the light traveling there change. And then with the light that is in the reference, they don't find anything. So they are completely defaced, the two beings. One, because you have the molecules, and in the other, you don't have nothing. So finally, when they encounter in here, they are in the phase, and then they make this interferometric pattern. Okay, this is the standard interferometric technique. Sensing, reference, and then something in, your, in one of the beings, what made that is a very a different between the light traveling in one, uh, in one area, in, in, the, in one part, arm in the other. So, and then the, we call this interferometric pattern, and this is completely correlated to the number of molecules that had been recognized here in the sensing area. Okay, I hope that this is clear for you. Okay, what happened is that the max standard interferometer is a very well-known device in telecommunications. But in telecommunications, they are not using for biosensing, they are using just for transport, transporting the light. But in our case, we want to have a biosensor, so what we need is to have a very high surface sensitivity, so we need a very strong emanation field. This is first, but second, you know that the light is traveling in different modes, and we need to have only one mode of the light because all the modes has different evanescent wave profile, and we don't want to mix everything. We want to have a very clear signal, so we need to have single mode behavior 
of the light, and we need a very strong evanescent field. So when we go to the lab and we make all the designs, so first you have to do all the modeling, and then in the modeling, if you want to work in the visible range, important in biosensor, I want also to say something. In, the, in optical biosensor, we always work invisible. The reason is because all the biomolecules that we are going to evaluate they are completely transparent in the visible range. If we are working to infrared or to the other wavelength, it could happen that the biomolecules can absorb light. And this is not our idea because we are monitoring only the chain of the refracted index. So we don't want that the molecules at the same time absorb light. So that's the reason why you will see that almost everybody working in this area, we work in the visible range in biosensor. Okay, so then when we do the, module, the calculation, we realize that the only way using silicon nit I mean silicon technology, standard technology, is using a waveguide of silicon nitride that has um, a width below four microns. So the, the waveguide has, normally we use three microns, this is the width. Okay, the thickness is uh, just hundreds of nanometers, like 250 nanometers, but more important, they have a rib. I mean, in order to have this single mode behavior that is only three nanometers. Yo, pay attention, this is three nanometers. So we have our, our wet guy is three microns is the width. The thickness is uh, 250 nanometers, and they have just a rip of only three nanometers where we have to coupling all the light. It's the only way to have a single mode behavior in the visible range with this material and also have a very strong immanence field. Okay, it looks like uh, crazy to try to fabricate this, but then you go to the clean room, and finally we have been able, we have a very established technology since many years ago, where you fabricate using a standard technology. We don't need to use even electron beam, focus, I mean, uh, these very, uh, very fancy technologies, and then we can fabricate all our devices, that the one that you have seen here. So you have to believe me that uh, what we have here in each of these uh, chips are 20 sensors, and all of them have this three micron width, and they have this three nanometer height that, of course, you cannot see by eye. It's completely not possible, so we need atomic force microscopy to see the three nanometers. So just believe me that you have there 20 sensors inside. Huh? I will show again, and I will explain more things. Just, uh, I will explain later, but when you look, look, one of them has also some microfluidics incorporated. That is completely transparent. So just try to look on top of the sensor that they have also 20 microfluidics channel incorporated on top of, this, of the biosensor. Okay, so this is what we do. And then, to, well, this is not only my group, but there is also very few groups in the world are able to produce this technology. So there is uh, one company in the Netherlands that they make a very similar device, also an asymmetric mat sender. There is also IMEC and the Hent University in Belgium also fabricating this technology. Uh, there is also a group in Greece, but as far as I know, uh, I think there is another one in, in Singapore, but there is not many other people working able to produce this technology for biosensing. Okay, the good thing is that when we go and we evaluate all this max sender, we know that we get the best limit of detection, so we can go to even to 10 minus 8 refracted index unit. Some people have reported even 10 minus 9 refracted index unit. I will show you with real example what, what is the meaning of this. The meaning is that you can detect even at the level of single molecule using this technology. And remember that this is label free, no amplification, and in real samples. Okay, so with this technology, um, most, of, uh, most of the people are using this Max Sender technology. My group was using during many years. But then I was, someone in my group has, we have this idea. Okay, what happened with the max center is that you have to, uh, in coupling the light, divide it in two beams, recombining again. So you're taking a lot of space on the chip. And we were thinking, it's possible to do just an interferometer, but using one single weight guy. So in theory, it looks like a crazy idea, because in an interferometer, you need always one reference, sensing, and recombination, yes? This is the physics behind an interferometry. But then we have the idea, okay, perhaps what we can do is to play with the modes of the light. And then the idea, and we call this new device that we have the patent at the international level, B-Modal Wet Guy Interferometer Biosensor. 
So the idea is the following. Now we start with a single mode light. And here we have a step junction where we grow the, the waveguide and there we split between the fundamental and the first mode of the light. So since here, the two modes of the light are traveling together, but they have a different evanescent wave profile, so they're making interference between them. So now we have the solution, how it's possible to do in a single wet guy, just an interferometer. And then we have the two, I mean, the two modes of the light are traveling together, and finally at the end they make an interferometric pattern. So we open an sensing area in the middle, we put here our biomolecules, and because the evanescent wave is different, one is like the reference and the other one is like uh, the probing, the probing uh, mode, and finally we have an interferometric. Okay, this is an idea, okay? And then we have ideas are always working. And even if you made theor theory and then you made the, mod uh, the modelization, everything is working, yeah. So you have to go to the lab and then to demonstrate. And also we realize that the only way first to fabricate this device is also silicon nitride, but then the thickness now in the single mode section is only 150 nanometer, and in the B model section is 340 nanometer. It's the only way that this device is working. Still, the thickness, I mean the wave, the width, sorry, is three microns, and the rip is three nanometer. Okay, so we designed, we went to our clean room, so you see the design of the max, how it looks each chip. So in the box, you have the max sender and you have also the B-model wet guy interferometer. You can see both of them. And then we went to do a atomic force microscopy. And you see here for atomic force microscopy, you, we see that the rib uh, is really three nanometers. So now we have a very, very reproducible uh, technology in, in our lab. And the, the chip that you, have, that you have in the box, we have a total length of uh, 30 millimeters. Uh, this is so long because we have, I mean, then the optical path interacting with the biomolecules is very long, meaning that we can increase the sensitivity. That's the main reason why we make so long device. Uh, so the sensing window where we are really having all our biomolecules is 15 millimeters. We have 20 independent sensors per chip. So they are separated, each other 250 microns. Remember that because we have also microfluidics and we have to do a microfluidics in each of the sensors in an independent way, okay? And then we fabricate at this moment 200 sensors per wafer. We went to the lab and then we were surprised that the sensitivity, optical sensitivity that we were able to evaluate was 10 minus eight refracted index unit. That's the reason why we patented the device because we demonstrated how it's possible to make an interferometer uh, different completely for the max sender that everybody is using, but then only with one single wet guy. So mean that we can fabricate much more devices per wafer than other people. Okay, so, uh, but okay, you have the sensor. And with the sensor, you have nothing because you need to go to do a full integration. So you need to incorporate the light, you have to read out the light, you have to incorporate microfluidics, you have also to do all the biofunctionalization. So this is really, really a tricky task. And then, for example, for the means also that we have to use, I mean, one thing is the photonic sensor, another one is the microfluidics, another one is how is the lighting coupling. We need all the electronic control, we need the biofunctionalization. So this is a really, really multidisciplinary approach. So when you are working in this area, probably you need in your team to have people from physics, from engineer, electrical engineering, you need uh, biologists, you need chemists. So it's really, really what I have in my lab, uh, in my group, is a mix of completely different expertise. It's the only way uh, to, I mean, to progress in all these um, biosensor studies. Okay, microfluidics. So the idea of microfluidics is to provide an hermetic ceiling. And one of the best, the problem always with microfluidics are the air bubbles. If you don't have a very good ceiling, you have always the problem with air bubbles. Remember, this is an optical sensor. If you have a liquid and then enter, uh, air bubble is entering, it's there, you change suddenly the refracted index, so your signal is completely lost. So this is one of the main problems. You need also to have a very low cost microfluidics, because remember, the sensors are intended for single use. Make an analysis and then throw away. 
and uh, you need to have uh, also to take into account affording multiplexing. So remember the scythe where we have, and we have to fabricate a microfluidics in the same scythe. Okay, so there are many materials and technologies so you can fabricate the microfluidics in silicon, in glass, in polymer, so in ceramics. Mo mo uh, most of us were working with PDMS or metacrylate, mainly with polymer technologies. So there is many different technologies, micro-machining, hot embossing, injection molding, casting, 3D printing. So it depends on the application of what your, how you design your device, then you can use all these technologies. So this is how we are making in my lab, uh, we are making this microfluidics using PDMS technology. And uh, normally we use a S8 stamp mold to, I mean, to replicate all the PDMS. So the idea is this is my sensor. I have to define a flow cell just with a thickness. I mean, the distance here, the D, must be between 50 to 150 microns, and the height between 20 to 100 microns. Remember, if you have this tiny device, everything is happening on the sensor surface. So the microfluid has been at the same size because you make something very big. It's like to put your sensor in a swimming pool. So the molecules will be doing many rounds during hours before to find what is the surface. So you have to calculate. And it's uh, recommended that you never, never make something bigger than one, 100 micro, microns. So from the sensor surface to the I mean, to the microfluidics, you need to have a distance always less than 100 microns, okay? So this is how we make here. You see also the, how is the, the, the problem of the tubing, because we have, in this chip, for example, we have 16 uh, sensor, and now how, in, how to incorporate, because you fabricate each channel for each sensor, but now you have to put the tubing. So what we design also is a kind of spider, a shape that we are able to allocate all the tubings inside to do the measurements. So you see how it's complicating the story. It's not only to make in the chip, it's also making many other approaches. So this is how we fabricate. So you have to believe me, that this is the one that is circulating. You have the sensor behind the 20 sensor, and on top they have uh, an independent uh, mic uh, microfluid channel on top of the sensor. Okay, so this is the assembly, also how we make some assembly because we have to incorporate for the external world. Um, recently, we have been even working with some Australian colleagues, how it's possible not only to make uh, the microfluidics, but also to incorporate inside the pumps and the valves in order to open and close in an automatic way all the reagents, everything that we need to do the, the measurements inside our, our chip. So this is really a very sophisticated work. You can see also in our publications. So how it's possible just to control all the opening and close for the different channels in the sensor, just to incorporate the different reagents and the different samples. OK. Well, I will not explain too much, because uh, we have done a lot of work how to solve the problem of the incoupling of the light. Remember, they are nanometric with guys, so the incorporation of the, the light incoupling is always a nightmare here. And they read out using CCD cameras and so on. So we have been working, I mean, to, trying to solve for the problem of the light incoupling of the optical readout, so you can also see in our publications. But with this device, what we want to do, um, I mean, it's just to make a complete point of care, and I will show you first, before doing this uh, point of care, how it's possible to use for real application. Remember again that one of the main problems before going for real applications is, as always, uh, the biofunctionalization. And this technology is silicon nitride, it's not gold. Gold is much more easy to do chemistry and to do biofunctionalization. In silicon nitride, it's much more difficult because you need to do silanization procedures. So uh, these are the different silans that we have been using for different reasons in my lab. So you have to do first this chemical activation and after you do the biofunctionalization. Okay? So you have to optimize many parameters, as I say also yesterday, and also you have to develop all the anti-fouling strategies just uh, to be able to measure directly in you, in you, with human sample. So normally using hydrophilic blocking agents, mainly PEC, but other strategies in order to be able to avoid the non-specific interactions. Okay, when we have this, 
we just go for the real applications. But before that, I want to show you a comparison, because it's something that everybody asks me, a comparison between this my technology and the surface plasma resonance, the plasmonic technology that is normally the regular one. Okay, so we did this experiment. We took just one hormone, the human growth hormone. We deposit uh, the hormone and then we look at the interaction with the antibody. And then we make the calibration curve and then we saw that our technology is, was able to achieve a limit of detection of only eight picogram per milliliter. So we are in the femtomolar regime. Okay, in this particular experiment. So we did the same with our SPR system. And then we take the same immunoreagent, the same protocol, everything was the same. Of course, the chemistry is not the same because one is gold and the other one is silicon nitride. But then using the same experiment, we see that SPR is able to measure until a limit of detection of only four nanogram per milliliter. So 200 uh, picomolar. So means that the limit of detection has been improved 1,000 times. So we have the order of magnitude, much better sensitivity with this bimodal wet guy interferometer that with the plasmonic technology. This is mainly to for the interferometric technology that we are using, okay? Okay, so we are very excited with the results, so we try to do very complicated uh, applications. So the first one is the early identification of nosocomial infections. So do you know that nosocomial infections are the one that you get when you go to the hospital and you spend too much time in the hospital, you get many of these uh, infections. So normally there is uh, four prevalent bacteria that are the responsible for this infection, E. coli, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and the coagulase negative Staphylococcus. Okay, so you can measure this in a standard bio molecular biology lab, but normally you need to go there take the sample, go there, sometimes you have to uh, cultivate to grow the bacteria or using PCR, whatever, but you really need to go to a central laboratory and then to, to give the, this to train it personal and it's time consuming. So our idea was it's possible to have a chip where we can identify and quantify the bacteria in the, in the sample of the patient and once you identify the bacteria, it's possible to have another chip where you analyze the antibiotic resistant profile of the bacteria, and then you know which uh, antibiotic you have to give to this patient. So to go for a real personalized medicine. Okay, so what we did was the following. We have been focusing in E. coli at this moment. And then what we did it was to immobilize a specific antibody that is uh, specific to one of the antigens in the membrane of the E. coli bacteria. Okay, we may make all the blocking steps also in, in order to be able to use a real sample. And then we took um, acetate fluid from, from a patient in the hospital, the Valdebron Hospital in Barcelona. And then with this, uh, we have been able to measure until a limit of detection of only four CFU per milliliter in the real, in the acetate fluid from the patient without no cleaning, without no uh, any treatment. So, uh, in total, things, uh, I mean, are conditionally, I mean, we um, mobilized the antibody and so on, and we start all the experiment. So, we have been able to analyze in less than 20 minutes. And then also, you can recover and to break uh, with um, regeneration, sol regeneration solution, and then to be ready for the next analysis, at, at least in the, in the, at the laboratory level. Okay, now we, ha we know that the patient has E. coli, okay? But we want to know the resistant profile of this uh, bacteria. So we have been working with the following idea. So the idea is, okay, we take the bacteria, we have to break the bacteria, we have to analyze the DNA, but we want to see if this particular E. coli has, uh, the, we are looking for, uh, in, that, in this case, for two genes that uh, sequence in the gene that encode the production of the beta-lactamase enzyme, that is the one responsible for the degradation of the lactamase uh, antibiotics, okay? So, uh, if we're able to see that the bacteria has these two gene sequences, we know that then we cannot give this antibiotic to the patient because uh, the bacteria has this resistant profile uh, to the, to the beta-lactam because they are producing this enzyme that is completely destroying the antibiotic, okay? So, um, 
Our idea was, of course, you want to detect the genetic sequence, you have to take the bacteria, you have to break the bacteria, you have to extract the DNA, but it's a very simple methodology because when we have the DNA extraction, we fragment it because they are very long uh, sequences. But now we have prepared in our biosensor the complementary sequence, and we have to flow all this on the sensor and to see if we can catch the complementary uh, gen sequence or not. But what is more important, when we make this fragmentation and the naturalization of the DNA, we don't need to make any PCR amplification. Even if we have very low number of um, bacteria, we are able to make this, I mean, to take the DNA uh, from the bacteria and then just to go to our sensor. And we have been uh, working with these two gen sequences that are related to the production, to this enzyme, to the beta lactamase enzyme, and we have been able to prove how with our biosensor we can detect this sequence of the gene until a limit of detection of only 5.8 atomolar. It is amazing that we can detect in real time. Also, we check the specificity. We check that it's completely selective to these sequences. Uh, and also for the other sequence, we just went down to 4.6 atomolar. So we demonstrate that in 30 minutes, we can take the bacteria, we can open or break the bacteria, make the lysis, take the DNA, make fragmentation, and then um, desaburization, and then just flow in our biosensor, and then to check if you have the sequence or not. And then we know now what is the, if you have to give this uh, uh, antibiotic or, or not to the patient. So in the future, our idea, because we have 20 sensors in parallel, is that we can do this for all the sequences in one of the bacteria, for many different antibiotics, so you can have a very fast um, analysis, like in 30 minutes, and to know which one is the right treatment that you have to give to the patient. And our idea, we are working with the people uh, in the, for the emergency unit in the Valdebron Hospital in Barcelona. This is one of the main hospitals in Spain and they really want to like to have this in the, in the emergency unit, that they don't have to send a sample to the, to the microbiology lab and to wait sometimes one day, two days, or even more for the results. Okay, we have been doing also another experiment where uh, we have been also able to differentiate between the, in the case of the Staphylococcus aureus, you know that there is the Staphylococcus aureus, there is one that is completely resistant to methicillin, the MARSA. This is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, this is resistant to, the, um, to methicillin because this bacteria is producing in the membrane, uh, they are expressing the protein PV2E, uh, 2A, sorry, and that's the reason why they are completely. Uh, and this protein is destroying also this antibiotic, giving the resistance to methicillin to, 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 to this bacteria. Okay, so we wanted just to differentiate, but there is another one that is the, the standard one that has not this uh, protein, and then this is not resistant to the, to the uh, penicillin, to methicillin, sorry, to the antibiotic. Okay, uh, we were lucky that there is a commercial actamer completely selective against this protein. So we were able just to immobilize the actamer in our B-model wet guide chip, and then we were able to differentiate, to differentiate between the MARSA and between the one that is uh, not um, resistant to the, to the antibiotic. Even we went also to the SEM and to the microscope, I hope that you can see here, and you can see here, for example, in the one we have this aptamer and put the one that has not expressed the protein, so we don't have any attachment. I mean, there is no interaction, we see nothing. But here in the one that we have the aptamer, you can see how many bacteria MARSA are already captured by this aptamer on top of our sensor. Okay, this is the limit of detection that we get here. So another project that we are working with this biosensor is detection of microRNAs. You know, microRNAs are very short sequences of R uh, messenger RNA. And, um, and they have been discovered a few years ago that uh, these microRNAs are circulating in our body. So you can find, you can find them in blood, in urine, in, many, in saliva, in many places. And they are always correlated with a pathology. So they can be correlated mainly with cancer, but can be correlated also with neurodegenerative diseases, with diabetes, and so on. 
So the problem, problem is that they are in a very, very low concentration. So normally they are in the picomolar atomolar range. And also uh, they have the problem that when you have one of these microRNAs, you have very similar ones. So some of them that dif differ each other only in one single base. Okay, so we thought, well, this is a good problem for us because our technology is so sensitive that we can go for the atomolar level. And also because we know how to make a perfect functionalization in such a way that we can avoid the, no, I mean, the interaction with the very similar microRNAs. So we have a methodology where we can detect only, only exclusively the microRNAs we want to detect. So in this example, we were looking uh, for the microRNA uh, here, uh, 1A1A, A, that is related to the blade cancer. And for that, we just developed all the methodology, and then we did just experiment in buffer in the lab, and then we saw that we catch this microRNA until a limit of detection of only 20 atomolar again. But of course, this is very nice in the lab, and then we put in a ring, and then we were able also to do all the measurements. But the good thing is that we took a real sample from people that has a healthy donor and blood, people with blood cancer, and then we just used the ring of these people, and then we were able to measure directly in the ring of the people the presence of this microRNA. So we were able to stratify the healthy donor and the people having blood cancer just because of the presence of this very, very short microRNA at this very low limit of detection, I mean, with this very low concentration. Okay, you want uh, someone is interesting? We published this two years ago, so you can see also, it's not uh, photonics, it's a ICS sensor, I make a mistake. So you can see also the details in our publication. Okay, so we're working now is we'd like to do in the future with this technology, because we know this is a very high sensitive technology, is to provide something like this. We are going to prepare our biochip uh, for different applications. Okay, once you have the chip for each application, we are producing a kind of point of care like that, where we have the optical coupling, out coupling, all the microelectronics, so you put your chip, just wait a few seconds, and then you get the signal in your mobile phone. So what is, this is what we would like to produce in the next uh, years. And I would like to say, okay, that when you have your biochip, imagine this biochip that you have seen, we mobilize antibodies, we mobilize DNA in the different channels. Okay, in the lab, because we normally make this also with our microfluidics, everything is in flow, in liquid. I mean, the proteins are alive, they are happy there with the PBS and so on. But what happens if you want to deliver, I mean, to use in any place at any time? So now we have some packaging strategies. We have a special machine and a special methodology that we are not disclosing how we are making that. But once we have all the covalent bonding, we have all the antibodies and everything, we know how to uh, have a, a procedure where we can like dry and then to make a, a, a complete vacuum, uh, uh, under vacuum packaging, and then we can provide the sensor, um, we can be a storage, the sensor with all the biofunctionalization for several months, and then to be used in any place at any time. Okay, if I have, uh, yes, I think I have some time. I would like also to show you some other uh, European projects where we have been working in a very similar way. The idea is always the same. Develop a biosensor where you can use for the real, uh, real uh, life. And in this project in particular, um, we were funded to do a low cost point of care uh, device, biosensor for active tuberculosis detection, and especially for Africa. This is one of the mandatory, um, uh, man was mandatory by the European Union that we have to do this the device uh, for Africa. Okay, so, well, after three years, so we start for, from scratch, and in three years, we were able to produce this, uh, uh, what we call pocket. Well, it's not really, really a pocket device. You see, it's really, really much bigger. But okay, uh, in, in this point of care, we introduced this chip, that the one that you can see here. I think I forgot to bring with me. Uh, so just look at the size of the, put in the, in this. Look at the size of the chip in comparison with one coin. And inside we have six Max Fender interferometers, 
with on-chip spectral analyzer, everything on-chip. Okay. So now we are using as a light source to illuminate all the sensor uh, SLD. We are using for the optical readout a CMOS camera. Everything is incorporated in the device. This is the cartridge where we introduce the sensor here. <coughs> and then, I think I have here, we introduce with sun syringes here in this position, the sample. Okay, um, the, uh, <coughs> oh, I'm going to. Okay, now even this, the point of care has incorporated the uh, computer, uh, everything is on board. Um, then we're analyzing, in this particular case, we are analyzing the presence of a small polysaccharide in the urine of the patient. It has been proven that the people having active tuberculosis, due to the pathogenesis of the bacteria, the tuberculosis bacteria, the, there is this liposaccharide, lamp, it's called LAM, that appear in the urine of the people. Okay, so we are analyzing uh, this particular uh, analyte. Okay, and then, well, this is just a detail how the sensor looks like. Um, okay, and this is how is the cartridge, where we just incorporate here the sensor, we just inject a buffer first to make a condition of the sensor, and then we're in sample. We take one milliliter, well, one milliliter is a lot, even we don't need so much, but the microfluidic has also waste here, where the one milliliter is after the measurement, the one milliliter is there. So everything is not going to be any waste. Everything is in, in, the, in, the, same, in the same package. And finally, we're looking for this uh, lamp for this lipopolysaccharide found in the microbacterial cell wall. And, um, and many of the tests commercially available, they are not able to detect TB in people without IHB. And we wanted to demonstrate that in our test, we can detect the, uh, the tuberculosis depend independently if you have or not IHB. Okay, so these are the results. We do all this uh, biofinalization protocol. You can see here how all the six sensors are working just the same. And uh, this is for the different concentration that we were testing in buffer. And then when we found here, it was something very strange, is that uh, in buffer, uh, we get uh, just a limit of detection of like uh, 956 picogram per milliliter, but then we decided, okay, we're going to introduce urine, 50% of urine, and then the limit of detection was better, but when we introduce complete urine, 100% urine, the limit of detection was even better. So it looked like this antibody, this particular antibody for lamb, they really like to be in urine, and they is working much better in urine than in buffer. So finally, we were able to, uh, to have a limit of detection in 100% urine of uh, 475 picograms per milliliter. Okay, so we're very happy with that. And then what we did is to take 20 samples from Tanzania, samples that were have been analyzed before for the standard techniques. You see here that the urine from the people are completely different. You have different colors, different densities. But then we introduced this in our biosensor without no cleaning, no filtering, anything. And then we have been able to detect who are the healthy because, of course, my, our colleagues, they sent the sample. They didn't say which one is infected or not, so we didn't know anything. And then we did all the measurements we sent to our German colleagues. And then we saw that we have, I mean, with our biosensor, uh, we were able to, to know, I mean, to predict which one was a healthy person, which one has active tuberculosis, and which one have active tuberculosis with IHB and without IHB. So it was really, really a very good result. So we have just a sensitivity 100% and a specificity and so on. So it was really, we were very happy uh, with this result. Now what we're doing is uh, because taking advantage that we have six sensors and we are using the same for measuring only one biomarker. So now we are extending to more biomarker to make a much more accurate analysis. So still we are working uh, with the device. So I must say that the results are really amazing. But then our problem, we have a complete device, a complete point of care. We can go to any place to do the analysis, just book the, the one milliliter of the urine. You can, we can do the analysis of children. This is very difficult to make in, and with other techniques for tuberculosis. And then the problem is no, nobody wants to commercialize. Hmm? Because, I mean, to go for a commercial device, I mean, something is when you have something in your, in your, um, 
in your lab, and even if it's working, it's really, really like a pre-commercial prototype, as you see. Uh, but then, uh, then you have to go, you want to make a commercial device, you need a company, you need a lot of investment, and until now we didn't found anyone that wants to commercialize the device. So the European Union is very angry with us. They say, okay, we are investing on you, and we want that you make a product of that. And we say, oh, but we are scientists, we cannot do everything. So if any of you have enough money and want to invest, this is a, a very good opportunity. Okay, and then to, if I have some time, I would like also to show also another European project, a very successful one, still not completely finished, that uh, we have also the idea of if it's possible to detect sepsis. You know that sepsis is one of the main problems in the hospital, but uh, it's a fatal uh, inflammatory reaction when you have uh, this uh, very severe infection. And the problem is uh, uh, there is more than 7 million of people per year dying due to sepsis in, in our hospitals. So the main problem with uh, sepsis is also the how to make a very early detection. And then we wanted just to make a point of care where our idea was to have a detection in less than 30 minutes, label free, with a high level of multiplexing. And we decided just to look for different biomarker, protein, microRNA, and bacteria. Everything at the same time looking at the, at the serum or the plasma of the patient, okay? So this is our idea. And then for that, we started also from scratch. We have nothing. And then the, the idea, uh, was the following, so this is the biomarker, protein C-reactive protein, procalcitonin, several microRNAs, bacteria E. coli, and Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, so the reader that we have been doing, the, I mean the biosensor is a mixture between nanoplasmonic and interferometric uh, technology. So what we are fabricating is a nanoplasmonic chip with nanoholes, and then we have an interferometric readout. This is a lens-free microscopy, what we're using, because as you see here, we're using a LED, and then we have divided by a suburb plate into beams. So one of the beams is uh, traveling through the sample, and the other one is traveling to the empty space. And we recombine, recombine it again using another suburb plate, the two beams, and then we have an interferometric readout. So we are, what, what we're doing with this new technology is an interferometric lens-free microscopy. It's not only that we're using one single point, so we are just measuring just in, a, in a, an array. So this is how it looks, the reader. This is the actual size. This is a very small one, so it's really portable. We go to the hospital to do now all the analysis with this. This is the microchip, where we have these nanoplasmonic nanoholes and also the microfluidics. So uh, what we're doing to detect this is to make a spotting of all the bioreceptor to measure in parallel all the, all the different biomarkers. We're using deep pain nanolithography technique that we have two machines in our lab. So this is just like a spotter. Yeah, a spotter just in a very small size. So normally we use a sample less than between 10 to 60 microns. So this is a spotter. So we just make, put all the bioreceptor the antibodies, the, micro, the sequence for the microRNA, or the antibodies for the bacteria. So it looks like the spotter. So this is an image uh, microscopy that you can see here. And then finally, this is how it looks like, for example, when we allocate this is for the orientation of the protein, blocking, and the antibody. And then you can see here for the different color. And then you see how is the signal increasing or, the, or, increasing or decreasing depending on the, um, the biofunctionalization protocol. Okay, some results. So we, have, we were very surprised that with this technology, we have been able to evaluate, for example, the bacteria in a very wide dynamic range. So we have been able to evaluate for 10 to 10 to 6 bacteria in the same. So this is a very, very wide re dynamic range. Uh, we have a limit of detection of 8 bacteria per milliliter. Uh, we have been also doing all the protein biomarkers as well, also with a very low limit of detection. And we also uh, develop all the methodology that we can detect in the uh, plasma sample without any problem at all, without not interfering. And probably the best result, we took the, the machine, we went to the hospital, and then in the hospital they give us all the um, plasma sample from the people. And then we have been able, we are very proud that we have been able to stratify that people that is healthy, 
people that have an infection but it's not related with bacterial infection and people that have sepsis. So this is only in 30 minutes we have been able to make all the, well in that case I think it was 40. Okay, but then it's just one step, a step analysis on site. That is the most important. They don't need to send a sample to the central laboratory. We can go just to the emergency unit. They are in the hospital and then to do the analysis. And also see that the, the, we need a very low sample volume. We are using 10 microliters from the per patient to do the analysis. This is that, uh, the volume that is allowed in this point of care uh, device. And it's a very user friendly, it's very fast, the POC device, I mean the device is, this is the, the size, this is like a, a shoe box, so this is really, really small. Okay, so, well, this is, uh, it's already in press, it's already in, in, in the, uh, we have many publications, several publications, now we are still, we are decided just to work more in the technology because we, Still, we need to improve the sensitivity in this device, but I think in three years it's a very, very good achievement, starting from scratch, how to develop a point of care that you can offer and then you can go to the hospital to do the real measurements. Okay, so with this, I would like to show, uh, well, uh, just to, to finalize, I uh, just give you some uh, final message. So, my main question is, do you think after all my presentation that bi optical biosensor can offer a competitive solution for diagnostic? Is this the future of the diagnostic? Are we going to have all these point of care devices for everything? Still, we have many scientific challenges, so still we need uh, sometimes to increase the sensitivity, especially when you have a very small analyzing, very low concentrations. Uh, still, I mean, the working with multiple sync capabilities and the microfluidics, well, there are some few, few labs that we are able to work with that, but it's not a general. Uh, uh, um, general way, just now, nowadays, complex media, because, I mean, in my lab, for example, for each different application, normally we take more than one year to develop everything, because working with complex media is not so, so easy to be able to have a methodology where you can avoid in plasma and serum during the interference. And, uh, well, they have the problem also, the variability between the patients, so, in some cases, for example, and the one that I showed different urine, we didn't have any problem. In other cases, you can have problem, and also depending on what you're looking for, our patient, that if they have a different medication, they have also some cross-reactivity with the different medication, so this is not so easy from patient to patient. Uh, so the trends is that um, people, they need, because remember, this is single use, uh, you really need to go for precise large scale sensor fabrication with very low cost technology. Okay, integration, in the, I mean, to make a complete device, uh, point of care is not so easy. Uh, we think also that the future will be this flexible substrate and wearable biosensor that you can uh, have your sensor, I mean, on your body. This could be also a trend. But of course, another thing that I want that you think about is this, all these social issues. Do you think this is going to be, we always say, okay, point of care is going to be the most democratic diagnostic in the world because then everybody can use the pure and the rich people, but I don't know if this is completely true. There is ethical issues because depending on the result, you can discriminate people because you know, okay, well, this, this person have this and this and this, so. And also, do you think we are going to be over-diagnostic? We are going to have a complete new hypochondriac uh, society that you get up any morning and then you measure many things, may get a colorectal cancer today or a blade cancer or whatever. So, so this is another problem. Just uh, you can think about that. And if it's working, I have a video for you. There is no sound. The sound? The light? to reach peak fitness for your body and your mind. Q gives you the power to see how what you do and what you eat affects your body at the deepest level, the molecular level. 
Pew will make recommendations based on your body, your health, and your schedule. It's simple. Insert your cartridge, take your sample, and get results on your phone in just minutes. Q knows the food that will help you recover fast and protect your heart for the long run, helping you become your healthiest and strongest self. Q gives you the information you need when you need it, so that you can take care of the ones you love and have more informed conversations with your doctor. I'll send the prescription over to the pharmacy that your husband's with. Yeah, that's yeah, that's perfect. Okay. And alert others in your community so that you can act quickly. Q puts the power of your health into your hands allowing you to make the best choices for the ones you love, your health, your life, <laughs> and your future. This is Q. Okay. Well, this is... Um, <laughs> This video, this video is from American company, that the US company, that they, they did the video before the, bios, the point of care. So still we are waiting, I mean the video is very nice, now everybody we can use to show what we are developing. But uh, they, did, they don't have yet the te this technology on the market, I think they invest a lot of money in this video, but it's a really, really nice to see what is the future of the point of care technology. So well, before finishing, I want just to acknowledge the people in my group that they are working while I'm traveling now in Brazil, last week in Mexico, so and so on. And so also my group has started some few spin-off companies and the financial funding and mainly from, from Europe. And all of you for your attention, so thank you. Now I have time for questions, yes? Yeah, sure. Wow. <laughs> questions? Or comments? Or what do you think? Is it going to be the future or not? Or what do you think? <laughs> uh, about sepsis, uh, that data that you present uh, appears how long before the clinical signs of sepsis? This is the big problem. Yeah, this is the big problem. So the idea with this uh, point of care is that they can have in the emergency unit and when someone starts to, uh, I mean, they have some symptoms, they can do the analysis and then they can classify. Even they can do, for example, every three hours. I mean, because you need only 10 microliters of the sample from the pattern. It's not so painful. So probably, I mean, they can do it continuously. The problem is that you have just half an hour mm -hmm. uh, when the symptoms appear. My question is, you can predict it before the, site, the clinical signs with your system? Well, it depends on the biomarker because it's something that we always discuss with the medical, with the clinicians, because they say, okay, we have this biomarker, and then, the, but this biomarker are really indicative that you are developing this, or you are going to develop this, uh, uh, the sepsis, for example. So according with the clinicians, they say, okay, if you develop, I mean, you are analyzing this protein, this microRNA, and this bacteria. Yes, this is the, the, their answer. So I really don't know if this is the, if true or not, but we depend always on the clinicians. So they say, okay, we have this biomarker. If we measure, we think this person is going to be to a sepsis, we have to believe that, uh, them. What we're doing is preparing the technology. We have a very, very good technology. So depending on the biomarker that the clinicians say to us that you have to look for, is what we do. So they say that it's possible to detect in advance. What they say. I, ca I, can, I cannot... Um, this is the limitation. Of your well, the limitation of all this technology is the biomarker. Because you always depend on the clinicians to say, uh, this is the biomarker related to this, this as in. So it's something that I cannot do. I mean, it's, I have to wait always for the clinical input. And you know, in the biomarker discovery, there is not so many of these biomarkers that are completely reliable just now. But it's the, the only thing, I mean, it's the, the only thing that we can do is to rely on the clinician, so. Thank you very much, Prof, for your presentation. <coughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. 
I would like to know, uh, you spoke on, in your previous presentation about how you diagnose uh, cancer using this blood sample. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know, using your technology, is it possible to have an immobilized antibody? And we know cells in the body, they have different uh, diameter or different sizes. Mm -hmm. And based on this size and fair, for example, that, okay, yes, you have cancer. And to know whether uh, tumor cells, and to say, like, this is a fibroblast. Mm -hmm. Using the marker for the fibroblast, can the technology provide it? The second question is, if we have such a membrane, can we provide a cell separation system for a flow cytometry? Let's say if you're interested in isolating one population, mm -hmm. and we just use this marker and we flow the sample. And well, I mean, this technology is not so, um, I mean, it's not for differentiating between different size, is the, 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 I think the question you're uh, um, asking me. Uh, so you can differentiate the cells only if you have a specific bioreceptor in the membrane of the cell and then you can identify. For example, people have been evaluating circulating tumor cells. That's possible with this technology. But remember that then you have to look for some kind of biomarker or signature that you can differentiate in a specific way. So it's not that you can classify for, for SAIF. I mean, this is not the, this technology is not uh, for this, uh, I mean, it's not for this application. So you need always, always to have a selective uh, a molecule capturing what you want to analyze, okay? okay? But it's possible to do, for example, there are some people, not my group, but other people have been working with capture, I mean, uh, identifying circular, circular tumor cells in just in the blood of the people. Using biosensing, plasmonic, nanoplasmonic technology. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Here. Thank okay. you for, for the presentation. Uh, my question is more on the price. Uh, okay. when, when do you expect that these type of technologies can be affordable for the general public? Or what's, mm -hmm. a, what's the main thing that needs to change for mm -hmm. you as developers of these technologies to be mm -hmm. able to reduce the, these prices? Mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. we can have access. Okay, well, the, I mean, the price, uh, for example, um, for all these projects that I presented, uh, um, like the one for tuberculosis or for sepsis, we always make all this calculation of the price because the European Union always asks us to do that. So this is our low-cost technology. For example, in the case of the tuberculosis, uh, we quantify that even the sensor, the um, antibody that you incorporate, the microfluidics and everything, uh, I mean, the chip, the test could be like uh, less than 10 euros, okay? One single test. That is much cheaper to any tuberculosis test that you have now on the market. Okay, what is the machine? The machine could be um, uh, more uh, expensive. In that the case of the tuberculosis, we calculate could be like uh, 10,000 euros. But remember, the machine is always there. So you have the machine for thousands of analysis. The only cost is the, uh, the cartridge. So normally, what we think in this area is, okay, I can provide you the machine or the point of care uh, for free because you have to buy always the cartridge. And this is the business, it's in the cartridge. But all this technology, because we use a standard microelectronics technology, a standard just uh, this microfluidics in a very low cost polymer. Uh, so um, the num I mean, the quantity of antibodies that is also very, very expensive you allocate in this very small sensor is also minimum. It's very, very low. So, the, I mean, the cost could be very, very low. So it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. It's more the problem how to go for commercialization when you have a biochip, where you make a covalent bonding with your protein or your DNA, and you have to maintain a life for a long time. And then to send to, I mean, you are operating in the lab, in the lab is working well, but then you go to, came here with 30 degrees or 90% of humidity or whatever, and then you have to maintain everything alive. This is more uh, a technical issues, more than the cost. The cost is not, uh, I don't think the cost will be the problem. Any case, for example, if I can provide a point of care to make uh, that I can avoid colonoscopy, so colonoscopy is 500 uh, euros or dollars, okay? If I sell my point of care, my chip, by 50 or even 100, any case, it's even more, uh, more ch cheaper. So I guess, uh, it's going to depend on the application. But in, 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 I mean, normally they are low-cost technology. Thank you for your talk. Uh, you mentioned that the, you have the, 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 the light passing through the fluid, right? 
and sometimes no. bubbles are an issue? Ah, yes. Well, the light is traveling always in the, in the sensor, inside the waveguide, and you have only the part of the magnetic wave that is oh. sensing what is happening on the surface of the sensor. Normally, we measure everything in liquid. If there is a, a bubble coming, you have a very uh, a strong refracted index chain from water to air, and then you see the signal is like, wow, <laughs> you lost the signal completely. So that's the reason why, I mean, the, all these biosensors are designed to be operating in liquid, in water, okay? Because all the body fluids are also um, liquid fluids, so it's, that's the, the main issue with the air bubbles. Oh, all right. Yeah, that's like when the air bubbles is a nightmare for all the people working in optical biosensors. Uh, it's a nightmare. For, uh, for example, how possible will be, will be to have like these uh, electrochemical reactions to form some sort of uh, uh, changes in the cladding of the fiber? So it mm -hmm. will be like, I don't know if it will be linear enough to have a quantification or identification of uh, analytes. Well, I mean, you can always make amplification. I mean, uh, I, my main goal is always to have um, um, a resector and to catch what I want to analyze in a direct way, one step, yeah? Because then I can go to the clinics to go, I can go through the real, um, real uh, evaluation. But of course, if you don't have enough signal, you can always amplify with another antibody, with another nanoparticle, whatever. You can always go for amplification and then you can get much better signal. This is not a problem. But uh, the main idea is trying always to go only for one step analysis. If not, well, I mean, something ha sometimes happens. You have a very low concentration, very a small molecule, and sometimes we need to do some amplification. Thank you. Okay, let's thank again Professor Lechuga for the excellent course.